Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, the scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. We're here today with Robin Tanamachi, Professor of Atmospheric Sciences and Awesomeness in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences here at Purdue. Welcome, Robin. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Nicely done. <Thank> you. <laughs> well, I guess let's just start with the uh, whole atmospheric science. We'll get to the awesomeness later. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the atmospheric <laughs> science side of things. Well, because, uh, I mean, I have people... I remember I was out in the community at an event, and someone stopped me. Oh, do you know what she studies? And I was like, they're trying to tell me about some of the things you've done. I'm like, well, I, I happen to know a little bit about what she I do studies. a lot of things. And so. so, yeah, more than I realized, though. <laughs> yeah, which one? And so uh, let's start. Well, it was the, uh, the uh, what they call it, invisible tornadoes. Oh, right, right, right. It. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, it was fun listening to people recount their version of what you do sure so that's it's it's always entertaining and i always like hearing what people's versions of things like that but right let's get from the source today though so what what is it that you study let's start there so my main focus is on uh, radar-based studies of severe convective storms and tornadoes that's been my research specialty basically since graduate school and uh, radar is my favorite tool to work with because it's one of the only atmospheric observing tools that we can use to get a full three-dimensional, actually four-dimensional, if you count the time as a dimension picture of what goes on inside of severe thunderstorms. And you can do that remotely and safely. Um, mm. So, you know, deploying instruments in severe thunderstorms in those situations can be uh, dangerous and also very expensive. I've taken part in field programs where we've done some stuff like that. But also, um, you know, we usually will incorporate one or two ground-based mobile Doppler radars to actually take measurements of wind and precipitation in the storm and find out exactly what's going on inside of it. So I like to think of it as sort of lifting the hood on, for example, a supercell and figuring out what's actually going on inside that's causing it to bruise all the hazardous conditions that it's making, like hail, strong winds, and even tornadoes. Uh, so I, I got to ask, because the first thing that came to mind was this is probably the question you get tired of quickly. So a uh, twister, how much is real? That is my exact what? question. <laughs> <laughs> how much twister. is real? Yeah. I got a twister story for you guys, too, which is that movie came out when I was about 15. And uh, I was in the theater with like a bunch of my other teenage friends and we were watching that movie just the week that it came out of course i was already you know i died in the wool tornado geek and so i knew i wanted to see it i was being shushed because i was laughing at stuff that wasn't funny <laughs> <laughs> to everyone else I'm laughing at things like tornadoes coming out of stratus clouds and the hail yeah. falling that's clearly like, you know, ice cubes hitting the yeah. ground. And, <laughs> <laughs> and even the part where, where Bill Paxton looks at the supercell, you know, he's watching this beautiful sculpted updraft twisting off in the distance and he just kind of shrugs and turns away from it and goes back to what he's doing. I'm like, I would be going nuts taking pictures and video. <laughs> So, yeah, there were some parts of it that, that uh, didn't quite square for me. <laughs> <laughs> what about the overall science, though? So You said you, that, that it is possible and you have been a part of some things that actually put sensors in. Right. So uh, is the, the basics of something like, like that movie where they actually had what they call it Dorothy 2 or yeah, whatever? Dorothy. They, they, yeah, Dorothy. They set it out and then it picked up the instruments. Is, is something like that actual doable? I mean, or is that just all Hollywood? Okay. So um, there's a couple of historical, actual historical field programs in which the plot for Twister was actually rooted. The first one was back in the early 1980s. There was actually a real probe that looked very much like Dorothy, and it was called TOTO. Um, TOTO <laughs> was an acronym <laughs> Wow. for Totable Tornado Observatory. But unlike Dorothy, it didn't actually contain a bunch of airborne sensors, which, you know, I'll, I'll go off on this in a minute, but um, they, they, that actually resembles sort of like the, the unmanned aerial vehicle 
yeah. approach that is actually being used now. So maybe it was kind of look forward looking and backward looking at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so Toto, instead of containing small airborne sensors, was actually like a weather station encased in a giant cement foot. It was like an oil drum just full of cement. Mm -hmm. And the idea was you would drop this thing in the path of a tornado, get the heck out of the way, let the tornado pass over it, and you'd measure wind speed and pressure inside the tornado, mm -hmm. and then go back and pick it up later. And, you know, this is 1980, so a lot of the stuff yeah. is, you know, analog, all being recorded on strip charts and things like that. Well, they used it for two or three years, and I think they had one near miss. And um, this was very dramatically documented in a TV special for Nova that was that came mm. out in 1985, which, by the way, was one of these sort of inspirational TV events that got me much more interested <laughs> in severe weather. <laughs> so, um, so Hollywood drew their inspiration for the Dorothy probe from Toto, but then also um, they. There had been an actual field program going on in 1994-95 called VORTEX, and VORTEX is this $6 acronym. It stands for Verification of the Origins of Rotation in Tornadoes Experiment. And that was very much like in, is portrayed in the movie. There's this nomadic group of people with instruments, and they were trying to surround the tornado with different kinds of instrumentation mm -hmm. and take scientific measurements on it. And that like I said, took place in 1994-95. And from that, we learned that the uh, temperature fields in and around tornadic and non-tornadic supercells, which are the kind of rotating thunderstorm that's most likely to produce violent tornadoes, uh, actually don't look all that different. And so that forced us to go back to the drawing board and then plan a Vortex 2, which I got to take part in as a, as a, uh, a graduate student. So um, Hollywood did draw their inspiration for a lot of the uh, instruments and the plot and the science and the scientists that were in that film uh, from real people and real events. But, of course, they have to add their own yep. <laughs> their own uh, embellishments onto the story. So, mm -hmm. but Because otherwise it wouldn't be entertaining. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of what we do is mm -hmm. just sort of like driving and chatting about this and that. So um, <laughs> that's the part that they never show on TV. Yeah. On, on two, uh, a movie that's two hours long and just you driving around chatting would right, not be yeah. Yeah, a blockbuster. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You know. These TV shows have come out that show some of the, the drama that goes on when you're, when you're driving around and talking. And, and, uh, and that makes for good television, but maybe not for a good Hollywood film. So, yeah. True. But the, all right, so the sensors, the data the movie portrays from the sensors is actually pretty much what you can get from all of your radar, isn't it? Right, yeah. So they were trying to track um, these sensors moving around inside mm -hmm. the tornado vortex and see where they're moving. Um, and we can collect very similar data remotely and safely using radar. So yeah. radar has the capability to measure not just the intensity of precipitation in different parts of the storm, but also its motion toward or away from the radar. And so then we can actually map out the vortex almost in full three dimensions just by using a radar system. And that's been a real boon for us in terms of uh, deducing what the internal structures of tornadoes look like. There's some that have internal downdrafts, for example. you People kind of classically think of tornadoes as sucking everything up into the air, but yeah. they may have an axial downdraft in the middle that's relatively precipitation-free. Oh. Yeah. Now, I remember as a kid, I just cut you off. You're oh, that's right. all right. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you were part of a program that brought a radar to campus. Right, right? yeah. So, um, since radar is my favorite instrument, mm -hmm. um, and I was literally like surrounded by radars mm -hmm. during the 13 years that I lived and worked in Norman, Oklahoma, I got to work with radars ranging from really small W band truck mounted radars, which are extremely short wavelength, very nearsighted kind of radars, but mm -hmm. they get really high detail, mm -hmm. um, all the way up to I got to run an experimental WSR 88D, um, which is the same kind of radar that the Weather Service uses. It's huge, it's 10 centimeter wavelength, the dish is 8 meters wide. Um, and so pushing some buttons and watching that gigantic dish rotate was kind of a power trip for me. Yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I missed that, you know, when I came here. And mm -hmm. that was one of the negotiation points when I was when I was uh, in my negotiations to, to come here as a professor was, you know, I am a 
mainly a radar meteorologist and I there's no radar here at Purdue so uh, as part of my startup package they gave me a pretty healthy chunk of change to go radar shopping and so it took a year or two but we were able to get a model that fit the budget and that actually fit the specs of a radome that I just happened to notice is on top of the building across the street that was not built for me it was built for another professor who subsequently left Purdue and so it was just sitting there empty so it was like it was waiting for me to come along and put something in there yeah so yeah we were able to put an X-band which is a three centimeter radar um, inside that dome in June of 2018 it's been operating ever since just scanning the atmosphere over Purdue And the really nice thing is that it fills a lower atmospheric observing gap between the WSR-88Ds that the Weather Service operates in Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and Chicago. So, like, if you draw a triangle between those three places, like, we're basically at the centroid of that triangle, meaning the radar beams from those radars are crossing about a kilometer or more above our heads. So Mm -hmm. we're missing um, all kinds of sensible weather that's going Mm -hmm. on near the surface here. And so we're trying to fill that lower atmospheric observing gap. I think it's something a lot of people don't realize when they hear about, yeah. oh, the Indianapolis radar, they assume it picks up everything up to a distance, mm-hmm. but it is it is going higher and higher as it goes away. Right. Because it's, it's, it's departing at an angle. Right. So um, because the radar has to overshoot, you know, nearby trees and buildings at Indianapolis, they have to uh, actually elevate the beam a little bit above the horizon. It's like a half a degree but that half a degree upward adjustment means that by the time the beam gets to us, it's like 1.2 kilometers above our heads. Mm-hmm. So we're, it's not actually giving us a representation of what's actually going on at the surface here at Purdue. Um, yeah. And our radar uh, does a much better job of that. So um, our radar's name is, we, we've uh, named it the uh, X-Band Teaching and Research Radar, which spells out the acronym EXTRA, X-T-R-R-A. And so if you, um, if you Google that, you can uh, come up with our website where we actually have live data from from the extra running 24 hours a day. That's so cool. And we'll put that in the show notes, too, yeah, sure, to make it easy on people. Yeah. Now, what is different near surface that this is measuring that a kilometer high? What's different in the atmosphere that we would see? So raindrops that are, you know, 1.2 kilometers up, a lot of things can happen to them between the time that the 88D at... Indianapolis scans them and the time that they actually reach the surface, they may size sort, meaning like the bigger drops can fall out first and then just smaller drops are left at the end. So you get a different drop size distribution between the time that it's up there, everything's mixed together, and by the time it gets to the surface, everything kind of sorted into different bins. Um, We're not actually detecting things like circulations at the surface underneath severe thunderstorms. So if a tornado is developing, they would be relying on looking at what's called the low-level mesocyclone inside of a thunderstorm, and uh, and they're not actually getting measurements of wind near the surface that would be associated with an actual tornado making contact with the ground and doing damage at the surface. So um, so we like to think that, yeah, we're, we're filling a gap uh, mm. underneath the 88D beam there. And we, we know, I know from uh, having spoken to meteorologists at both the Indianapolis and Fort Wayne office that during severe weather events, if there's any question about whether a storm passing over or near the Lafayette area has a potential to produce a tornado, they load up our website and look at our radar data. Um, I've been trying, uh, and not successfully so far, to get an actual data feed, like an actual hookup to, of the data feed, all the way to, straight to the Weather Service so they can look at it oh. using their own visualization tools and algorithms. Um, that hasn't worked out quite yet, though. It's proven hmm. to be a bit more complicated than I thought. Hmm. Uh. Most projects seem to always be more complicated than we think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many variables that we don't think about there were, that we don't know about. So let's back up before 15. I mean, when you were 15 years old, you're already a weather nerd. Absolutely, yeah. So my my what sort of my origin story. So I've been interested in weather ever since you know I can remember. Um, you know, I was one of those kids who was lying on my back in the grass looking at the clouds when I was really young, and then. Um, the real watershed moment came for me when I was about seven. Um, there was a severe thunderstorm in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. That That is where I was growing up at the time. And there was a television news helicopter from the NBC affiliate there in the Twin Cities area. It was on a totally unrelated assignment, nothing to do with weather. I think it had something to do with, like, music. And they were on their way to a concert, 
and they just happened to catch this tornado drop out of a thunderstorm as they were on their way. So they immediately broke off from their assigned yeah. <laughs> duty and went storm chasing with this helicopter. And they were able to get this really remarkable footage of this of this tornado that you know lasted ten or fifteen minutes, and that was broadcast live on television. And uh, then it was replayed ad nauseum over the next several <laughs> weeks in just about every broadcast, any excuse they could find to show it. Um, so that really captivated me as a young child that, you know, that there was you, just tornadoes, just the visual image of this tornado and its sort of sinuous structure was really captivating to me. And then in one of the specials that they concocted based on that footage afterward, um, they actually got a satellite interview with somebody from the National Severe Storms Lab. It was uh, Dr. Don Burgess, who works there at the Severe Storms Lab and studies tornadoes and was one of the principal investigators behind the, the WSR ADAD program. Um, and he was talking about how um, the... Purdue University, so tying right back here, had the, these these physical laboratory models of tornado vortex structure that is, had shown this sort of helical tornado structure, but they never actually seen it in nature. Is and that, that this snow, uh, this is yes, Church and Snow's Dr. work okay. back in the early '80s, and uh, they'd never actually seen that occur in nature until they saw this footage from this television news helicopter. But I remember sitting there as you know a seven year old and thinking, there are people who get paid to study tornadoes <laughs> wow. that sounds like the coolest job ever right so um i went and did a little bit of research at the local library what it takes to become a meteorologist and um basically tailored my educational path from that moment forward it was just like i was dead set on becoming a meteorologist at some point and i was really interested in severe weather so um i tailored all my my classes to you know I knew I needed the math I needed the physics and so I enrolled in an accelerated math program for the University of Minnesota and was able to then get um, actually calculus and stuff all out of the way even before I graduated from high school oh, wow. the benefit to me of, of doing that was that when I got to the University of Wisconsin Madison which was the nearest school to me that had a, a robust um, atmospheric science program that I was actually able to start their core curriculum a year earlier than most of my classmates. I was a sophomore and most of them were, were juniors. So um, so I was able to finish all of my core requirements a year early and then my senior year I was just taking like tons of electives and having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> um, after that I was uh, I was asked if I wanted to, to take part in some, some research experiences as an undergraduate, and so I spent one summer actually taking part in a field campaign called IHOP, the International H2O Project. So that was studying water vapor um, over the southern Great Plains and how that contributes to things like convective initiation, meaning how thunderstorms are born. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, as part of that, got to go and babysit an instrument in uh, atmospheric emitted radiance interferometer, which is the skyward pointing infrared radiance measuring instrument that's used to measure water vapor profiles in the atmosphere. And I was in the, the bustling metropolis of Booker, Texas, um, sitting with this instrument out in the middle of a farm field, basically, for like two weeks. <laughs> and during that time, so this is in the Texas panhandle, right? And during that two weeks that I was out there, you know, there were a couple rounds of severe weather big photogenic supercells and I actually did a little bit of chasing you know I got permission from my supervisor to, to leave the instrument for a little bit and go storm chasing and um, I thought you know I could get used to this this is fun so I, uh, I went ahead and applied to the University of Oklahoma because I had encountered out in the field there a couple of the graduate students from that program mm -hmm. and subsequently got a phone call from Dr. Howie Bluestein, who is a well-known uh, research scientist who specializes in radar-based studies of convective storms and tornadoes, and uh, he had seen my application. He got a good letter of recommendation from some folks I worked with at Wisconsin, and, and uh, he offered me a position as a research assistant in his lab. And so I was there in his lab from uh, 2002 until 2011, getting a master's and a PhD, uh, both in research meteorology and both on you know tornado-related projects. So that was... Uh, <laughs> That was definitely a formative experience for me, and I was able to, um, I was able to then, you know, pick up all the tools of the trade, participate in a lot of field work, and get connected with folks who I still, you know, I still work with to this day, and I still collaborate with to this day on on papers and field programs. So. 
Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. So I, I just want to clear up really quick. You said you were able to begin your core work a year earlier than your right. classmates. And is that because of the courses you took in high school? That is correct, yeah. Okay. So I was able to get all my calculus up through multivariable calculus and ordinary differential equations done uh, before I even started college. Wow. And so um, a lot of those credits ended up transferring to my undergraduate program in atmospheric science and so they were able to admit me to their their atmospheric science curriculum a year early that's excellent i think yeah. there it seems that a lot of high schools are going towards helping students get these college credits before they even graduate i know when i was still in the classroom there were many students graduating that already had college credit before yeah. they were even enrolling in their freshman year and i just think that's a really neat advantage for students yeah i was privileged to take part in a program through the university of oklahoma that was called the university of minnesota talented youth mathematics program which mm -hmm. is where they actually bring in students who are really gifted in math and actually let them learn from college instructors there learn their math wow. classes from college instructors and and uh so I got to use things like, you know, programming in Mathematica, and I got to do mm -hmm. all this multivariable calculus and and, uh, and analytic geometry and all that stuff mm -hmm. before I even went to college, which was, you know, it was put me head and shoulders above a lot of my classmates. It was really fun. Wow. Oh, I bet it did. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. That is such an awesome opportunity. Yeah. So, I mean, you're... I mean, uh, come on, you chase tornadoes for land's sakes. Uh, yeah. What do you say? For like 5% of the year, yeah. But <laughs> still. <laughs> you can still see I got a book out about that. So I, I know, it's right here. <laughs> I was going to set that over here here in a few minutes and right, ask right, you about yeah. the, the book here okay. to explain that. But but before I do ask you about that book and the other 95% of your time, mm -hmm. um, coolest thing you've done? Okay, coolest thing I've done. Um, from a science standpoint or just in general? <laughs> Go with really, in general. In general, oh goodness. Um, well, <laughs> as a graduate student, I actually got tapped um, for a summer consulting job. So I actually took you know a summer off from my my graduate research assistantship at OU, and actually I got to go over to Japan and work for a company called Weather News. They had this idea that they would um, they're like the Weather Channel of Japan, and they yeah. wanted to bring over some American storm chasers to kind of cover the Japanese typhoon season. Oh. So I actually got to spend a summer as a typhoon chaser over there. So I lived there for two and a half months and got to, you know, learn a little bit of Japanese. I know enough to order food, and that's about it because I didn't speak the language. But most important. got to reconnect with some family members who live over there, too. And so that was that was a really nice experience. And just, yeah, having to live and operate in another culture was really eye-opening for mm -hmm. me. Um, I think you've talked on this podcast before about just, like, doing study abroad or yeah. having international experience. I absolutely wholeheartedly recommend to all students, even if they can't do something like that, just to do some kind of project that gets you out of your comfort zone. Yes. My teaching philosophy has always been you learn the most when you are outside your comfort zone, when you are not comfortable and you're having to grapple with situations that you've never dealt with before. Um, and l living in a country that where English is not the primary language, uh, that was, you know, that, and, and the culture is very different and it's, it's very deeply rooted and ingrained in everything that they do and say. Um, that was a really eye-opening experience for me, and I, I just, it was a very formative uh, time for, for me as a young adult. That is cool. Yeah. All right, so you already did the spoiler alert, and I was going to break right this on. out. Yeah. And so tell me about this book that I have here. Okay. So the book that you've just laid on the table here is a book that's targeted at grades 5 through 7, uh, entitled The Tornado Scientist. And it's written by Mary Kay Carson, and the photographs are by her husband, Tom Ullman. So she reached out to me during my second year here at Purdue in 2016, um, saying she had this idea that she wanted to make a book about a tornado scientist. She had found my my blog, which I don't update very often anymore since I'm so busy as a professor, but she had, she reached out to me because she thought I would be a good subject for this book. Oh. Um, she's produced other books about uh, people who study, you know, who work on the Pluto New Horizons mission, for example, or study rhinoceroses in Africa. Um, and so she wanted to branch out and, and do one about tornado science. And she had a contract with a publisher who was interested in working on it. And so they actually came out uh, and worked with us in the field during part of the Vortex Southeast project, where we actually went and tried to catch tornadoes in Alabama. We're totally successful with that, but they were able to get some good photographs and, and uh, interviews in with me. So, 
so that's the mat- material upon which this book mm-hmm. is based. And then at the, in the meantime, I actually wrote a small amount of money in for her to um, to come with us in the field this year and document some of our activities with the students. And she produced a blog about it, which is at stormchase2019.com, where they came out with with us for a week um, with our Severe Storms field work class and actually took lots of great pictures of the students and that's formed a great you know media reservoir for me to draw on when I'm trying to oh, sell yeah. this course to back to the department every year. And were those people, because Sarah and I sat in you invited people from the department we took mm-hmm. up on it oh, yeah. really quickly yes. we snatched up <laughs> on that opportunity as fast. The um, spotter training. Right, yeah. Uh, were, were those people that were at that spotter right. training? Right, so our, our course um is called Severe Storms Field Work, and it's to give the students an opportunity to just like go out in the field for a week and help us do some severe weather research. Mm-hmm. So they get a little taste of that vortex or twister type activity that they've heard and, and read so much about. And uh, we put them to work, you know, collecting data for us uh, and, and logging it all. So uh, as part of the, the ramp up to that field trip, though, we have them all do storm spotter training, which is uh, put on by the National Weather Service. And we have a Purdue alum who works in the National Weather Service, Sam Lashley. And he's thrilled to come out and give this training to the students every year and just you know, reconnect with the department and find out what's going on. And so he teaches us about things like, you know, how to identify tornadoes versus tornado loops. Lookalikes. Yep. Um, there are a lot yep. of wannabe tornado-looking clouds that people report erroneously as tornadoes, and how to report things like hail sizes to the weather service. You never use the term marble, for example, because marbles can come in all kinds of sizes. Yeah. Use the coins in your pocket instead. Um, so just <laughs> things like that, and 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 just and in general, how to conduct yourself safely in and around severe weather mm-hmm. and to have an escape plan if you ever do need to bug out. And that's one of the things I liked about the storm spotter training. Right. I mean, it's mm-hmm. I, I know enough to be dangerous. I've been in this department for quite a while. I know enough <laughs> about a lot of things to be dangerous. And, uh, I mean, I took uh, weather classes from Dr. Smith when he was, I mean, mm-hmm. a couple decades ago. Yep. And so, <laughs> more than a couple of years. And, um, and so I knew enough to be dangerous, but I really enjoyed when we went through the storm spire thing, talking because I, I never really, some variables you don't think about, like what is your escape plan, what is the pattern things are going, and making sure you don't think about your own safety sometimes. You're like, oh, okay, I know what's going on here, but y- unless you plan ahead, you don't. Right, yeah. So so going over things like what are the basics of supercell structure, what yes. are the most dangerous parts of the storm, what are the best ways to approach a thunderstorm that you're trying to see, um, and then how do you report the things that you do observe to the weather service in a way that's going to effectively inform their warning decision-making mm-hmm. process. So, you know, reporting hail sizes, for example, you know, using the coins in your pocket, that's something that's instantly relatable and, you know, corresponds to an actual physical measurement. Uh, reporting a tornado or a wall cloud, for example, is it rotating? Is it not rotating? How mm-hmm. long have you been watching it? Where are you versus where is the thing that you're reporting? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times people will report, say, oh, the tornado is at my location or it'll be, be construed as being at their location when it's actually like five miles away, for yeah. example. Um, so how to how to effectively communicate that stuff to the weather service and kind of keep your head on straight and keep it on a swivel too while yep. you're while you're doing all that. So and I've seen you guys on the app that we use mm-hmm. to watch that. I've seen your guys' names pop up. So I know that we're using the same app. He suggested that's why we downloaded yep, it. Yep. We're excited and inspired enough. I mean, we've went, we have the apps, we did yep. the official training yep. and reported that. We did the online one, mm-hmm. and we both have our amateur radio license now. Oh, cool. Yeah. And yeah. so we, we have that so we can run out on, uh, hit the two many repeaters and be able to uh, yeah. do it there too. Excellent. Yeah. And that's amateur radio is something that I'm a big proponent of, especially when we're out in the field, just because, you know, we, we can use it be- to talk between mm-hmm. the vehicles and it's a lot more reliable than cell networks are out in the boondocks. And that's what people don't think and consider about. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have radio wave propagation wherever you are when you're transmitting, but you don't have cell signal wherever you are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and your, your cell phone is basically just a very small underpowered radio yeah. that's digital. Yeah. So where digital stuff doesn't work, analog technology like amateur radio still works. So 
5% of the time you're chasing tornadoes. 95% of the time? <laughs> 5% of the time I'm in the field, I'm chasing tornadoes, and 5% of my time I'm in the field. So, <laughs> yeah, so it becomes a vanishingly small uh, fraction of my time that's actually spent looking at tornadoes. And so the rest of the time is either spent prepping for those few moments when I'm actually in front of a tornado and trying to collect data. So getting myself prepared, getting my equipment prepared, getting my students prepared for that moment so that they can be ready to perform at, you know, it's like the Olympics, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, everything boils down to like 90 seconds or a few minutes <laughs> sometimes. Um, and all, all that training has to be, has to come to a head at that moment. So um, this is why a lot of times, you know, in these, these research groups that go out and study tornadoes, they have the senior graduate students do the data collection and the junior graduate students do like the driving, for example, or the navigation, because okay. they are the ones who are still trying to get the jitters out. I know I was like that, certainly when I was a younger graduate student. And, and uh, yeah, so you just have to kind of swallow your emotions down, do your job, collect the data, because there is no way to rewind the atmosphere and collect the data again. If you miss it, you're out maybe tens of thousands of dollars for the field oh. season. So, What all data are you collecting in the field? Okay, so um, in addition to the radar data that we collect mm -hmm. um, using a mobile radar, um, in the class we use uh, also weather balloons. So oh. small, you know, meteorological stations that actually, you know, we put them on a balloon and let them go. And so they collect data on temperature, pressure, humidity, and winds all the way up until they pop, uh, which can sometimes be as high as 10 kilometers up. Oh, and wow. You, so that's actually giving us a sense of, you know, how much moisture is available to any storms that do form and what the wind shear is like, which helps us to gauge the potential for different modes of storms, including supercells. Um, and then in addition to that, then uh, I work closely with Professor Dawson, who's also a professor here in this department, that uh, he's interested in the drop size distributions in storms. And so he has these probes that are called PIPs, Portable In-Situ pre uh, Precipitation Stations. And these are like kind of like the old Toto, but they're they're for measuring uh, drop sizes. So they actually have what's called a distrometer, this raindrop size measuring device uh, mounted on top. So we try to put those out in and around supercells in strategic places to collect information on the drop sizes. Um, you may want to know why that's the drop sizes are important. Well, you'll have to interview Professor Dawson about that <laughs> in like a future show because uh, I don't want to steal his thunder. Fair enough. No pun intended. We're uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, it went over my head for a second there, yeah. too. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so thank you. We appreciate your time. No problem. Thank and, uh, you for having me. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super, and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs>